Welcome back seventh grade. This is part two of Sword in the Stone from our textbook. We are going to start off on page 800 where we left off there had just been a battle on um, the first part of the tournament and the people who go through the tournament are able to have the opportunity to take the sword out of the stone. So we're with Sir Kay and his squire um, is his brother Arthur. Top of page 800. The next charge was to be undertaken with swords. Sir Kay was appointed captain of his team for having done so well in the first round. He trotted over to Arthur and handed down his lance. Kay, you were magnificent, gushed Arthur, wiping down the steaming war horse. You brought great honor to our house this day. I need my sword, Arthur, said Sir Kay, struggling to take his helmet off. Your sword, of course, said Arthur brightly. He turned to get it, but then stopped suddenly. Where was the sword? His eyes scanned the little tent with the, its collection of weaponry, spear, halberd, mace, bludgeon, but no sword. Excuse me, Kay, said Arthur. Could you use a battle axe? Arthur, please, my sword, said Sir Kay. We haven't much time. Of course, Kay, but just a moment. I'll finish polishing it, said Arthur, slipping out through the slit in their tent. With one great leap, he landed on his pony's back and galloped madly through the deserted streets, rushing back to their camp. Sword, sword, where did I put that sword, he muttered, desperately searching through the chests and bags, but to no avail. How could this happen, he thought, Kay without a sword and the whole world watching? He paced back and forth, and then a thought struck him. Kay will not be without a sword today. I know where I can get one. A few minutes later, he trotted into the churchyard where the sword and the anvil stood on a marble block. There wasn't a guard in sight. Even they had gone to the tourney. Quietly, he brought his pony up to the stone and tugged on the reins. Okay. Blaze, we'll just see if this sword can be unstuck, he whispered. He stretched out his arms until his fingers touched the hilt. Hey, it's looser than I thought. Steady, Blaze, steady, boy. As the pony stepped back a few paces, the sword gilded out of its anvil's grip, unbalancing Arthur. He regained his seat and looked down in wonder at the mighty blade in his hand. This isn't just any sword. Perhaps it's something the church provides for needy strangers. Yes, that must be it. Well, I'll return it after the tournament. Someone else may need it. Thank you, sword, for saving me, he said, pressing its cross to his lips. Wait until Kay sees this. He flung his cloak around the great sword and drove his little horse back to the tournament with lightning speed. By now, Sir Kay had dismounted and was rather chafed. Arthur, where have you been? He shouted. You? He caught himself as Arthur dropped to one knee and opened the cloak. Your sword, my lord, Arthur said confidently, but his smile quickly disappeared when he saw Sir Kay's reaction. Frozen in place, his face white as milk, Sir Kay stared at the sword. Finally, he spoke. Top of page 801. Where did you get this? He asked. Arthur, although he knew he asked Arthur, although he knew the answer. Arthur confessed that he had searched in vain for Sir Kay's sword, and he had borrowed this one instead. Get farther at once and tell no one of this, said Sir Kay sternly. Arthur thought he must be in terrible trouble. Surely he could return the sword without father knowing. Why did father have to be told? Nevertheless, he obeyed his brother and returned quickly with Sir Ector. Sir Kay closed the curtain of the tent and opened the cloak, revealing the sword to his father. Sir Ector gasped when he saw it. How can this be? Father, I am in possession of the sword, said Sir Kay nervously. That is what matters. Therefore, I must be king of all Britain. But how came you by it, son? asked Sir Ector. Well, sire, I needed a sword, and we couldn't find mine, so I decided to use this one, said Sir Kay, beads of sweat, sweat forming on his brow. And this is um, a place where you can inference how Sir Kay feels. The author never tells us that he's nervous or scared or anxious, but if you're sweating and he's stammering, we can tell, um, we can infer his mood by what the author is telling us. Very well, lad, you drew it out of the stone. I want to see you put it back. Let's go, said Sir Ector. But I have the sword, said Sir Kay. Isn't that enough? No, replied Sir Ector, as he mounted his horse and headed toward the cathedral. Arthur rode close behind, and ever so slowly, Sir Kay mounted and followed. The churchyard was still deserted when the three arrived. But the sword, put the sword back in the anvil, said Sir Ector bluntly. I must see it. Father, I... Just do it, Kay, and you shall be king, if that's what you want. Sir Kay climbed onto the block. Sweat was now pouring off of him. He raised the mighty sword over his head and plunged it downward, but the sharp point skidded across the surface of the anvil, causing Sir Kay to fall headfirst off the block. Now, son, tell me, how came you by this sword? said Sir Ector again. Arthur brought it to me, said Sir Kay, dusting himself off. He lost my other one. Suddenly a fear gripped Sir Ector's heart. Arthur, my boy, he said quietly, will you try it for us? Certainly, father, said Arthur, but do we have to tell anyone about this? Can't we just... Son, please, said Sir Ector, solemnly. If you can put the sword in the anvil, please do it now. 
With a pounding heart, the lad took the sword from Sir Kay's hand and climbed slowly onto the block of marble. Raising it with both hands over his head, he thrust it downward through the anvil, burying, it, burying the point deep within the stone. Effortlessly, he pulled it out again, glanced at his stunned father, and shoved the sword into the stone even deeper this time. Sir Ector shrieked and sank to his knees. His mouth moved, but no words came out. He put his hands together as in prayer. Silently, Sir Kay knelt and did the same. Father, what are you doing? cried Arthur, leaping down from the stone. Please get up, get up, I don't understand. Now I know, sputtered Sir Ector, choking back his tears. Now I know who you are. Top of page 802. I'm your son, father, said the bewildered lad, crouching down by his father and putting his head to Sir Ector's chest. After a few deep breaths, Sir Ector regained his composure. He smiled sadly, down at Arthur, and stroked his head. Fate would have it otherwise, my boy. Look there behind you. He pointed to the gold lettering on the marble block, which stated the purpose of the sword and the anvil. Arthur sat in silence and stared at the words in marble. Although you were adopted, I loved you like my own child, Arthur, said Sir Ector softly. But now I realize you have the blood of kings in you. you to discover your birthright is a true reason we came to London. You are now king and we, your faithful servants. At this, Arthur broke into tears. I don't want to be king, not if it means losing my father, he sobbed. You have a great destiny before you, Arthur. There's no use avoiding it, said Sir Ector. Arthur wiped his eyes with his sleeves. He straightened up so he could look Sir Ector in the eyes. A few minutes passed. Very well, Arthur said slowly. Whatever my destiny may be, I am willing to accept it, but I still need you with me. Then so it shall be, lad, so it shall be, said Sir Ector. They sat quietly for a time, comforting each other, until they felt another presence. From across the yard, a hooded figure quietly floated into the fading light of the winter afternoon and knelt down beside them. Merlin, said Sir Ector, bowing his head to the famous enchanter. I've been waiting for you, Arthur, said this, the wizard. You know me, my lord, said Arthur. I put you in this good man's care many years ago, and I've kept an eye on you ever since. How do you, how did you do that, sire? We live far from here. Oh, I have many ways, replied Merlin, but you still managed to surprise me. The sword pulling contest isn't until tomorrow, and you pulled it out today, he said with a chuckle. But what is to become of me now, said Arthur. Well, let us start with tomorrow, replied the old sorcerer. We must still have the contest to prove to the world that you are the rightful heir. I will come for you when the time is right. But after that, sire, what is my future? asked the boy. Merlin weighed this question carefully. He wasn't at all sure whether the boy <clears throat> was prepared for this answer. Finally, he spoke. I can't tell you what my powers, I can tell you what, only what my powers suggest, and they point to greatness. Greatness surrounds you like a golden cloak. Your achievements could inspire mankind for centuries to come, but you alone can fulfill this destiny, and then only if you wish it. You're, you own your future, you alone. Arthur breathed deeply and cast his eyes downward. He thought of all the goodbyes he would have to say. He thought of his fishing hole and the birds that ate seeds from his hand. He thought of the deer that came when he called them. What, what time tomorrow, sire? He asked. After all, we have tried and failed whenever that may be, replied Merlin. I will be ready, sire, said Arthur, um, bottom of page 803 after the picture. Then he rose, bade Merlin, Merlin farewell, and silently returned to his tent. On Christmas morning, the archbishop said mass for the largest gathering he had seen in years. The grounds surrounding the cathedral were also filled with those seeking to make history or watch it being made. As soon as the service ended, those who wished to try for the throne formed a line next to the marble block. Leading the king was King Urin of Gore, husband of Margay's, Uther Pendragon's adopted daughter. Ever since the High King's death, Urin can, had claimed loudly that he was the rightful heir. Indeed, he took his position on the marble block with a great sense of authority and gave the sword a confident tug, then another and another. Urin was sweating and yanking furiously when finally asked to step down. Next came King Lot of Orkney, husband of Morgan Le Fay. King Lot felt certain that his wife's magical powers would assure his victory. But pull and tug as he might, he couldn't move the sword. After that, King Mark of Corn Cornwall, King Leodrance of Camelard, and King Ryans of North Wales all took their place at the sword and failed. The Duke of Winchester, Colchester, Worcester, Ham Hamchester could not fare any better. Some thought the longer they waited, the looser the sword would become, thereby improving their chance. But this wasn't the case, for the sword never budged, not even slightly. Kings, dukes, earls, counts, and knights all left the marble block empty-handed. 
Finally, as the day waned and the line neared its end, the crowd grew impatient for the winner. Merlin went for Arthur. Sir Arthur and Sir Kay opened the curtain of their tent when they saw Merlin approaching. Your hour has come, my lord, said the old wizard to Arthur, who was standing, top of page 804, alone in the center of the tent. Silently, the boy walked forth as one in a dream. The crowd made way for them as they entered, for Merlin was still revered by all. But those, but who could these other people be, especially that young blonde lad dressed all in red? What was he doing here? Merlin brought Arthur before the archbishop and bowed deeply. Arthur dropped to one knee. My lord, said Merlin, I present to you a most worthy candidate for this contest. Has he your permission to attempt to pull yonder sword from the stone? The archbishop gazed down at the handsome lad. Merlin, we are not familiar with this youth nor his credentials, but what right does he come to this place? By the greatest right, my lord, said Merlin, for this is the true-born son of King Uther Pendragon and Queen Ygraine. The crowd broke into loud clamor as, at hearing this. The startled archbishop raised his hand, but order was not easily restored. Merlin, have you proof of this? asked the archbishop. With your permission, sire, blurted Arthur suddenly, perhaps I can prove it by handling yonder sword and the anvil. Very well then, lad, said the archbishop, admiring Arthur's youthful boldness. You have my permission. If what Merlin says is true, may God be with you. Arthur rose and stepped up to the marble block. He grabbed hold of the mighty golden hilt with both hands. A surge of sparkling warmth traveled up his arms, across his shoulders, and throughout his body. With one mighty tug, he freed the sword from the anvil and lifted it he heavenward. The blade flashed like lightning as he swung it round his head for all to see. Then turning the point downward again, he drove it back into the anvil with equal ease. The entire gathering stood dumbstruck for a long moment, trying to comprehend what they had just seen. Arthur looked about for reassurance. He looked to Sir Ector, then Merlin, then the Archbishop. They all simply stared at him with eyes wide in amazement. A child giggled and clapped his hands in glee. Then so did another and another. Cheers began to ring out as people found their voices again. Suddenly, a thunder of shouting and clapping rose up around Arthur. Amidst the tumult, he closed his eyes and whispered, Thank you, Father. Then he grabbed the sword hilt for a second time and withdrew it. As he brought it above his head, a thousand swords throughout the crowd were raised in solidarity. Arthur drove the sword back into the anvil and pulled it out once again. This time, as he lifted the great blade to the sky, more swords and halberds were raised, along with brooms, rakes, walking sticks, as counts and common folk alike saluted their newfound king. Not everyone was overjoyed at this turn of events, however. Although all had seen the miracle performed, several kings and dukes were unwilling to recognize Arthur's right to the throne. Loudest among the grumblers were King Lot and King Urin, Arthur's brother-in-laws. How dare this, top of page 80, 806, Beardless, unknown country boy think he can be made high king to rule over us, they said. Obviously, Merlin is using the boy to promote himself. But these malcontents gained no support from those around them and were quickly shut down, so they gathered themselves together and stormed away in a huff of indignation. To everyone else, the day belonged to Arthur. All the other kings and nobles rushed forth to show their acceptance, for they tr trusted Merlin and were grateful to have a leader at last. They hoisted the young king to be above their head to parade him around the streets of London. As the noisy procession flowed out of the churchyard, the archbishop hobbled over to Merlin to offer congratulations for a successful plan. Thank you, my lord, but I think we are not finished yet, said the wizard. The archbishop looked puzzled. I fear that King Lot and King Urien and those others discontented souls will leave us no peace until they have another chance at the sword, continued Merlin. We must offer them a new trial on New Year's Day. And so they did. But again, no one could budge the sword but Arthur. The same troublesome kings and dukes still refused to acknowledge his victory, though. So another trial took place on Candlemas, and yet another on Easter. By now, the people had grown impatient, for they believed in Arthur all along and had grown to love him. The idea of having a fresh young king inspired hope and optimism. The world suddenly felt young again. Finally, after the trial held on Pentecost, they cried out, Enough! Arthur has proven himself five times now. We will have him for our king and no other. The archbishop and Merlin agreed. There was beyond proof dis dispute at this point, so the coronation was set for May Day in the great cathedral of London. Upon arriving that morning, Arthur stepped up to the block and pulled the sword from the anvil for the last time. With the blade pointing heavenward, he entered the churchyard, walked solemnly down the central aisle, and laid the sword upon this, the altar. The archbishop administered the holy sacraments and finally placed the crown upon Arthur's head. Ten thousand cheers burst burst forth as the young king emerged from the cathedral. 
At Merlin's suggestion, Arthur stepped up the marble block to speak to the people. A hush fell over the masses as he raised his ha hands to address them. People of Britain, we are one now. And so shall we remain as long as there is a breath in my body. My faith in your courage and wisdom is boundless. I ask now for your faith in me. In your trust, I shall find my strength. For your good, I dedicate my life. May this sword lead us to our destiny. And that's the end of our story. Um, the next page has some information on the writer and then your questions, which are on um, Google Docs in your Google Classroom are on the next page if you wanna look back in the book. And as you read that story, think about other versions of it that you've heard, um, movies, shows, poems, plays, all of it. And if you haven't, if this is a brand new story to you, you might want to look up on YouTube or find a poem or another story. There's also a movie. Um, I know it's on Disney+. Plus. I don't know if it's on any other um, platform right now. But compare the two because that's what you'll need to do for your writing. Thanks and stay healthy.